Hey everyone, it's Louisa Tanner-Munson from Feel Good Astrology and this is a Feel Good Conversation that I'm really proud of. I'm really excited to share it with you. Um, I first came across my guest, Dr. Joe Delaney, when I was checking out the wonderful podcast um, by my good friend, Jeff Granville, who you may well have watched because we've done quite a few shows together. So they were chatting and he was very um, open about his journey uh, with alcoholism, with... Um, but with sort of like breaking down and breaking through and, and his life with spirit, you know, how, how the spirit of the universe or that feeling of divinity had come into him and changed his world. And so I invite him on the show and, um, yes, I've, um, literally just finished recording with him and I think you're going to love what, um, he's come up with. We've spoken about all sorts of different things from the key beliefs that lead to breakdown, um, to the key beliefs and the knowing that helps us get through that. And, and so much in between we've touched on acceptance, false identities. <laughs> we've really gone quite deep. So, Sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. Joe, welcome to the show. Um, thanks for joining me today. Um, now, it's really hard for me to get going because I'm feeling quite an intuitive rush going on right now. And it's probably because I'm in your presence um, and there's a bit of uh, symbiosis going on there. Um, I was fascinated by your talk that you had recently with Jeff Granville um, and I reached out to you and in doing so I've learned a little bit about you and your mindfulness training, your cardiac coherence coaching, resilience training. Um, tell me what's it like being you right now doing the work that you're doing? Well to be honest um, I haven't got a clue what's going on from one moment to the next <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you. And I think my, my formerly my problem was that I thought I knew what I was talking about. And I realize now I've got I've got very little understanding about absolutely anything. You know, it's almost like I'm scratching the surface and new yeah. stuff bubbles up. That that's how it seems to work with me now is that stuff is presented to me, you know. And if I want to be clever uh -huh. about it, I say that it's presented in the present moment, one bubble at a time, you know. And that's how mm -hmm. I live my life now. I've I surrendered um 30 years ago, I handed my will and my life over to the care of the universe. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. But before that, I tried to manage my own life based upon my so-called intellect. And it basically mm. kept taking me to the point of trying to kill myself, you know. Um, so my intellectuality, which is considerable, <laughs> right, was actually, it was the wrong way around. Really. My head was on upside down. Yeah. And really, I disconnected in that condition. The connection between my head and my heart, right, was was obstructed. And and yeah. I say these words now because they're about the simplest way I can explain it. That really, I was a split personality, you know. And oh, yeah. um, uh, my heart. Now, I see my heart, if you like, as the organ of my soul. Now, when I say soul, some people may think that I'm a religious person couldn't be further from the truth i've been described as very irreligious you know mm -hmm. but but the the heart to me like like the brain to me is the organ of the mind the mm -hmm. heart is the organ of the soul you know and what i mm -hmm. tend to do now louisa is i tend to if i don't know what to do which is most of the time i sink into my heart and i have a conversation with my heart you know as though i'm talking to a sage part of myself Right. You know, I've got yeah. like a little Yoda in there, you know, in my sort of imagination, there's almost like a well. And I go into this well place, you know, and it's it's almost like going into it's almost like Egyptian. I can't explain this, but I sort of go mm -hmm. through these corridors and I come oh. to this well and it's like the font or fount of all knowledge that's emerging. But there's like a little sort of sage person there that I have a conversation with. That's how it works for me, you know. I, yeah. And um, I just say, look, I'm a bit stuck here because I talk to it as though it's um, I'm very familiar with it. I'm a bit mm -hmm. stuck. I don't know what to do. If you could possibly help me, please. And I've done that now for the last 30 years of my life. And my life's changed totally. You know, I can see that before that I was trying to be serious, trying to be clever, trying to be academic, trying to be responsible. And it ba basically took me to the point where I tried to do myself in on two occasions. And I, I should be dead. But for some reason, 
Um, I'm not. And I got a feeling that that's more to do with my soul's purpose or mission. And I think that, you know, I'll just talk about the time that I really made a good attempt to do myself in. You know, I, I took a whole load of tablets. I should never have a headache for the rest of my life, the amount of tablets I took, you know, and a bottle of sherry because I couldn't afford whiskey at the time, you know, and I drank it all. <laughs> and all that all that consternation and confusion temporarily left me. And it was almost yeah. as if the peace that passeth all understanding descended upon me. In fact, I'm getting emotional talk about it now, and I do. This happens to me, right? Something descended upon me, and it was almost as if it said to me, son, you're not ready to go yet. You know, you you shouldn't have signed up for this if you can't take a joke. (laughs) And I thought, ha ha, bloody funny, you know. I said, and what we're going to do is, and I've got no idea who this word is, but, you know, I have ideas. You know, I I have pictures of things. They almost like turned me around and said, we're going to kick you up the bottom now and we're going to show you step by step the proper way to conduct your life so that you can find the joy of living and live in a lighthearted way and then pass that on to other people. Wow, that's a supersonic answer. I love that so much. Joe, you raised uh, loads of points there and there's four in particular. I, I was doing a three there there's four in particular I'd like to pull you back to um um and also the sherry I mean if you had have done yourself in on sherry yeah yeah LS. <laughs> oh my goodness it's it's bless you bless you in that situation that um you know that sherry would have been the last bit of alcohol you were tasting oh man um the first thing that really resonated me with what you just shared there was um, the rational mind and and how it leads you uh, astray or kept leading you back to wanting to do yourself in. What what have you come to learn about rationality and the rational mind um, since then? Because 30 years is a long time to be practicing what you're practicing. Yeah, what, what it led me to believe was that the whole system, the education system, the way the world set up, is back to front and upside down, really. And from the moment that we're born and even before, we can, our mind and our consciousness can be um, infiltrated and um, misdirected, if you like, by chemical means and also yeah. by other people's opinions and ideas on how we should live, you know. So it's almost like right from birth, we're almost injected with conditions and programs that take us away mm-hmm. from our natural essential selves, you know, and this is not yeah. something that I've made up, but I came to realize that as these things came to me, I would then read something which confirmed this, you know, and I've looked at the work of Maslow and Maslow's hierarchy of needs yeah. and also Carl Rogers as well, you know, and all these sorts of um also all sorts of people who were interested and probably fed intuitively by the way that it really is, you know, if you want to call Mm -hmm. that the truth vibration, you know, and I think there are certain people who for various reasons um, get fed with after they've been through stuff themselves, they get fed with the way that it is rather Mm -hmm. than the way that everybody else thinks that it should be, you know, so it's almost like about letting go of stuff in Mm -hmm. order for the essential self to come through. And I think that that's what's happening to me. The more I let go of what I previously believed, and this is where Jeff's work comes in, you know, you know, yeah. I've had a lot of chats with, or well, no, not that many, but I've, I've had chats with Jeff and deeper, meaningful stuff, you know. And um, to me, beliefs are the problem, really, because beliefs, yeah. you know, a, a belief is something that people think it considered to be true. But how many times have people had beliefs to have them washed away to realize that it wasn't true? You know, and I think that's what we're going through at the moment is. There's yeah, absolutely. Great, around the world. Yeah, there's a great <laughs> shift in consciousness. You know, I call this the tsunami of love. You know, I, I think that it's a it's a great big healing feminine cleansing energy. Right. That's mm-hmm. actually washing away all beliefs to leave yeah. what's true, you know, and I, I've talked to Jeff and, you know, it's about the biology beyond, beyond belief. You know, mm. so it's yeah, he about, talks about the physiology of divinity, doesn't he? Yeah, he talks about the physiology of yeah. knowing. And I think that there's a yeah. difference between a belief and knowing, you know, there's mm. knowledge. That's where our rational intellectual mind comes in. But then there's knowing, which is coming from an in, a different place. It's intuitive and it emerges mm. from deep within us and through us as well. I don't know whether that makes sense. but It totally makes sense know. to me. 
<laughs> it totally makes sense to me. I, I've always found, um, in fact, this morning I was feeling a little bit irritated about something. And um, when I sink into myself, uh, you know, because we all have our own process, when I sink into it, it's always where my mind has got the better of me. <laughs> you know, it's the rationality. Um, definitely. And, and I love, you know, surrendering was one of the other things I wanted to take you back to. And you've already kind of answered it. The more you surrender, the more, um, what I'm getting is that the more your beliefs break down and the knowing comes in. Is that right? Yeah. 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 I think surrender just means it means to say the ego mind then says, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. That's, that's a great big thing because I was like, uh, no, all knows football. I can't say that, but, um, um, yeah, a knowledgeable <laughs> idiot, you know that one. No all no fuck all, yeah, yeah. you know. Well, yeah. that's what I was, you know, because people would ask me a question, and even if I didn't know, I would like make a story up as though mm. I knew, because underpinning that was if I give the wrong answer here and look foolish, what will they think of me? And I've got yeah. to a position now is where I'm fortunately I couldn't give a shit what anybody else thinks about me at all. Even though it's nice and good or bad, I really don't care because it's not important to me anymore. What's become important yeah. to me, and it sounds really arrogant this, but it isn't. What's become important to me is how do you feel about yourself, Joe? Right. Are you okay with yourself? Yeah. Have you done the best that you can? Yeah. But so-and-so doesn't think that you'd have. <laughs> and here's here's yeah. my new sort of, you know, sort of uh, response to that is, fuck them. <laughs> I don't care what they think. I'm I not love in that. Yeah. I absolutely love that. You know, because I realize a lot of my problems come from actually worrying about what people think of me. And actually that's the kind of fuck them place is, is where I'm, wanting to get to myself i love that thank you um forgive me if um i do end up putting a beep over the the yeah, f some no jeffs um but it'd be really funny because <laughs> it could be quite a few <laughs> it's one of my yeah, favorite they, they do call me <laughs> dr f in joe <laughs> perfect perfect i think we we are here to be expressed aren't we um the the next thing i'd like to kind of bring you back to um was how you coped when you had your um kind of breakthroughs I don't want to call it a breakdown how you coped because 30 years ago like if like if I take myself back 30 years <laughs> I was just leaving school 17 and yeah I already had a sense of things um not being um as they were taught at school and and definitely was working intuitively back then but the material and the support that we had back then 30 years ago was quite scant I mean, there was, you know, obviously there were loads of people. You had to really look at, you had to really go searching for it. Now you can just go to YouTube or any kind of podcast. There's blogs. There's this, we've got so much access to material on how to free ourselves and to live with intention. And um, But back then it was a, a very different sort of story. That must have been quite shocking for the people that knew you, et cetera. What inner resources did you have to find at that time? Well, I was fortunate in that um, I ended up in a psychiatric department again. You know, I was I was uh, I was in there quite a few times because I kept wanting to throw myself off bridges and things like that and didn't understand. It was so okay. intense that all I used to run against the wall and hit my head on the wall to try and create some space for all this stuff that was coming in. And this was at the time of the harmonic convergence, apparently. Yeah. I didn't know anything about this. But there was a sake there was almost like a great influx of information that was coming, mm -hmm. you know. And you know, Louise and I didn't have a clue about these sorts of things, you know, but um looking back, I can see clearly now what was happening. Anyway, mm -hmm. um when I took all these tablets and the sherry, you know, it was like altar wine, really. But uh, I took the sherry, you know, and um, I ended up once again back in the psychiatric department. But I was in there for a long, long time. And at that time, an occupational therapist and a staff nurse had been on a course. They'd been on a motivational interviewing course that was based upon humanistic psychology. Uh -huh. right? And they started to ask me questions, which is called they're called clean languaging questions, which basically asked asked me about me, you know, and mm -hmm. they say, Well, how do you feel about this, Joe? Don't give yeah. us the answers that you think that we want you to hear. Just mm -hmm. tell us how do you feel. And I'd never been asked this before because normally when I went to the health professional, they would tell me what I needed to do. 
you know. Yeah. And so they would give me the instructions and I would I would close off after two minutes because I'm not stupid, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Even though I was trying to do myself in, I wasn't stupid. I was totally and utterly lost. So yeah. the occupational therapist and the staff nurse asked me questions. And they waited till I replied. And what this did is I had to use my own metaphorical language to start to understand what was going on deep within my unconscious mind. Now, we've gone quite deep here already, but I didn't really know. But I was started to unravel all the knots in my unconscious and trying to verbalize them using my own metaphors you know, and that's why when I heard it coming out of my mouth, I thought, oh, I didn't realize that before. So the realization started to happen like ticker tape. And what they did was their questioning almost caused me to get deeper and deeper and deeper and start to the process of self-realization. Now, self-realization and self-acceptance, they're tricky that because what I was really finding out was the stuff that I was trying to hide away from myself for a long time. So I almost had to start to get honest about the disturbance that was always also coming up as these yes. things were released. I mean, we've gone deep already, but emotional disturbance is a very, very positive thing. If you mm. can mindfully step away from it and just allow it to emerge, because once you accept it, all the energy that's been used for years to compress it and repress it and suppress it and hide it is then released back into your system. And all this enthusiasm starts to break through. But I've mm-hmm. gone into lecture mode now, Louise. I, I'm sorry. No, I love it. Um, I, I, I love it. I was wanting to ask you, actually, funnily enough, about the role of acceptance and sort of accepting your intuition and and, and trusting because it it's an act of deep trust, isn't it? you know, to go with that ticker tape. I understand that from um, the work I do, um, you know, when I'm, uh, I'm focusing with a client, something kind of erupts in me and comes out and it's, <laughs> I just have to trust that whatever comes out is is meant to be there. <laughs> um, but it's a bit of a weird thing to sort of explain away, isn't it? So um, I love that. Thank you so much. Um, if you're okay with me going deeper... <laughs> Okay. I, love, I, love anything at all. I always see it's, it's purposeful and it's supposed to happen yeah. so go for it yeah what key beliefs were you holding about yourself that created that disturbance in the first place well two sets of beliefs really there was a fifth on the top which was my conscious mind which was mm-hmm. always saying come on joe you're not thick you've got all these qualifications you should be able to work this out right but yeah. there was four fifths underneath going ha 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 dickhead right you know so yeah yeah so so there was always that one that was always having a go at me it was the critical one you know that critical thing because every time I did something it was never never good enough and I'm going to be honest about it now it was mostly said uh, from my unconscious in the voice of my mum you know because my mother was the most influential person in my life she's the Mm. person and she's still knocking about me mom she's in her nursing home just around the corner you know but um she she was the person that i loved with all my heart Mm. and hated with all my heart at the same time you know and i i do a talk called the mummy's curse you know because um you know i i've i've come from a sort of a deeply um, roman catholic background in uh-huh. fact at the age of 11 i was sent away as the eldest to train to become a priest and things like that you know so uh, so i was yeah. brought up in that sort of irish catholic celtic tradition which has impacted very very deeply on me and uh, in a positive way now there's lots and lots of good stuff that's coming out of that now but um yeah there was always the voice of my mother Right, mm. that was stopping me and obstructing me. For example, you're too clever for your own good, you. You know, and I used to get that at a very early age. Now, yeah. I'm not knocking my mum here, because if you like, that was the sole contract between me and my mum. That was that Oedipal complex that people go through. So we can go into stereotypes and stuff. I understand all that now. But I, I go and see my mum now, and she still tells me how to live my life. But now I still I just laugh about it now. <laughs> because I basically take no notice, right? Yeah. You know, I don't emotionally engage with it anymore. But mm. I remember she said to me once, what do you want to do someone you grow up? You know, <laughs> probably last week, you know, she said, uh, she said, and I said, I want to be a doctor mom. And she said, ooh, ooh, you don't want to do that, right? First of all, they've got more money than us. 
they're cleverer than us. They live in bigger houses than us, and they're more, you know, they're more intelligent than we are. So that was immediately stopping me from actually yeah. pursuing my deepest uh, desires, really, you know. And I, I see that now. That's a whole heap of know your place, isn't it? You know, you're not good enough. We're not those kinds of people. There's, it's not just your mum's voice there. That's the voice of um, the dominant narrative yeah. that, you know, there is a place for us all to sit. And, you know, you know, we, we, we're happy to be ruled. And we have to be because we're not good enough and we're not given that responsibility. It's a, it's a hard one to break through. So you had these like four, um, you had this overarching belief saying, you know, I can do this, I can do this and, and that and the other, and I want to. And then these other ones underneath kind of undermining you. Oh, oh, very much so. I mean, and, you know, from an emotional processing point of view, one fifth, let's say one fifth, mm -hmm. it goes on consciously, but four yeah. fifths influence the choices that we really make, you know, and, and yeah. I can see that subtle, if you want to call that evil, because that's lived the other way around, isn't it? You know, so I don't <laughs> believe in good and bad as such. I yeah. see it all as experiential, really, in this sort of yeah. human sort of game that we play. So, so yeah. And when the alcohol came along, it was disinhibitory and deconditioning, and it let temporarily let all that stuff be relaxed. And all this energy, it was like an atomic explosion. That was the addiction. It yeah. just freed me to do what the F in L I pleased and I was yes. free. I loved it. I actually, from a thinking point of view, I became very, very clear on how things work. So it's sort mm. of released now, if you like, my intelligence rather than my intellect. And that, yeah. that was the great thing about the addiction. But over time, I needed more and more and more to try and get the release. And then one day I would drink as much as I could and it wouldn't come. And then that was the problem then, you see. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's fascinating that you found you found a way to release yourself from the expectations that felt like they were crushing you. Um, and because you weren't generating it yourself because it wasn't coming from you, it couldn't be. Uh, it, it couldn't be a strategy that would take you forever, <laughs> you know, to, that would help you thrive. It, yeah, it was um, the Romans used to say in the in vino veritas, and what came out there was the, you know, the truth came out, and that's why yeah. you see people when they're pissed, yeah. you know, and they get to that point where the sort of lock comes off, you know, and mm -hmm. out Pandora's box comes out, and woof, and that's the way that they really, really feel at the time. That's that yeah. that's all the stuff they don't mean to be horrible, generally speaking, you know, mm -hmm. that's all the stuff that's being compressed you know, over years and years and years and years, and maybe even previous lifetimes, if you believe in all that, for the purpose of realizing what's in there that needs to be cleansed and recorrected. Or, yeah. you know, sometimes I see the earth as a sort of correctional facility, to be honest with you, you know, and as I see that we're all here, right, in for behavioral change, you know, and I think, well, all right, if that's the game, because I have to sort of I have to use cognitive behavioral therapy on me and then reframe it then and say, well, okay, this is the game that I signed up for. How can I play it as best as possibly can, you know? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. I love that. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to connect with you, not just because you had this like great conversation with Jeff, um, but I, I also, I had a bit of an alcohol issue <laughs> myself. Um, and I did feel that release, that sense of release of the expectations and the identity. And I felt very free to be myself. Um, and it started to cost me um, along the way. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see that. So what key beliefs then led to your actual breakthroughs? You know, so like when you came out the other side, how did those um, unconscious, the lower four fifths, how did they function? How did they change? Like, it's presumably they're still there at some level. What happened was I went I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Uh -huh. And Alcoholics Anonymous has a system, if you like, hmm. where you actually, you've got to such a point that you have to turn around and face yourself. And that's the rock bottom. Mm -hmm. I see it as a crucifixion, you know. And I have to be rigorously honest, right? absolutely and utterly rigorously honest as I can about what's going on. And so I went through the program of recovery, right, step by step, right. And what I basically had to do is I had to write a list of all persons I had harmed 
and yeah. became willing to make amends to them all. And I went and found, you know, with a sponsor, a wise person who'd been through the process, right? I went back to the people I'd harmed and face to face said to them, I am so sorry for what I've done to you, right? But mm. I didn't go back to old sort of relationships because that would hurt them more, you know. So, mm. so you have to you have to be sensible about it. But there were yeah. some people, and they said, "Yo, you're an absolutely lovely fella, but when you've got drink down, you're a pain in the ass, right? We <laughs> wish you the best of luck. Don't ever drink again, right? Now, yeah. most people said you're lovely, you know, we, you're so funny, you're so clever, you're so this, that, and the other. Good luck to you." But there were some people who said to me, never darken my door again, right? And mm. I was upset by that because I wanted everybody to love me, you see. And I went back to my yeah. sponsor and he would say, Joe, have you taken the action to face these people and said sorry? And I said, yeah. And when they replied to you, what did you say? And I said, well, I did what you said. I didn't give any more response. I just came away. And they said, your work is done. You know, because you can't please everybody. So mm. I have to just clean my side of the street, yeah. you know. And, you know, it's only the ego that wants to go back and try and to convince them that you're really a good person. That's all part of that ego game again. Yeah. So I did that. And at the end of doing that, Louisa, right, he said to me, is there anything else at all that you're ashamed of, that you've done, that you can think of, anything at all? that where you've harmed somebody else or even yourself, right? And we went through a whole list of people. And what I normally do is you start off with your family, right? And they just say, oh, shut up, you dickhead, because we know who you are, you know, and all this sort of business, you know. And so you start off and go through these things. At the end of it, my sponsor said to me, because I had a list of paper, he said to me, is there anything else that you take to the grave with you that you haven't been honest about? And I said, no, there's not a single thing. So that was the cleansing of both my conscious and my unconscious mind. And he said, see that paper? Come with me into the backyard, right? He said, here's a lighter. Set light to it and let it go, right? And I swear to you, right, I could feel a great big thing. Here, here it comes again. Mm -hmm. So you're getting emotional. I can feel it coming again. Oops. <laughs> so there was a great big release. Okay. And then he said to me, when I went back in, he said to me, go home now and just sit quietly and just feel what might have happened tonight. So I went home. I was living on my own at the time in a shitty, horrible little flat, you know, and I put the light on. Uh, I sat down on my bed and I just sort of, as I was sort of thinking what had gone on, this voice said to me, this is no shit, this, you know, this voice said to me, Joseph, we love you. <laughs> oh, I thought, oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God. I'll be back in the psychiatric department in no time, you know. And I got that. And I said to this voice, I said out loud, I said, F off. See, I'm being light now. I said, F off. Come back in the morning when it's light. Right. Anyway, I <sighs> fell into a really, really deep sleep. And when I woke up the next morning, I was in a completely different world, completely different world. I looked at the news on the television. It didn't make any sense to me. It was a completely mm. different world. And that, to me, was my big spiritual awakening. And wow. that's when that's when my life was turned around. Because, Louisa, I had to take these actions. I couldn't yeah. just think my way out of this. I had yeah. to take the, the actions in order to prove, if you like, my humility, whatever that means. I mean, you, you've you been on a huge kind of hero's journey, haven't you? And it, it, it kind of fits in with um, so many other um, like practices and, and ways of thinking. Like I, I, I always think of um, the phoenix, you know, it, it has to burn completely to the ground, um, like completely become dust before it can come back and regenerate. It has to let go of it's a complete surrender. And, you know, you mentioned um, like a crucifixion. And then after that comes the resurrection. You know, it, it's like we have to yield to the death. And, you know, for some people, um, allowing the death of their ego, <laughs> it's just not going to happen, is it? And yet that sounds like the process that you, you put yourself through. It takes a lot of courage to do that. I think it takes a lot of desperation. They say sometimes it's God is the gift of desperation, you know, mm. and I think that's the thing is you let go 
See, keeping hold of her, letting go is dead easy. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing is the pain's in hanging on to old stuff. So mm. all my ideas, all my emotions, all my attitudes, every single thing that has formed my personality up to that point, I let go of, yeah. you know. Yeah. But it's not that I wasn't left with anything. I was left then, I believe, with my essential characteristics. And I think that, yeah. you know, I think that personality is to do with the ego. You know, books mm -hmm. just persona. Me is the lecture coming out now. Persona means mask. You know, so it's pretentious and false. But character is of the soul. That's the essential true self. You know, yeah. that that's underneath all this crap that's covering it. Really, what well, what you said there really um, matches my own experience. Is I can't create any kind of meaningful change until I recognise that the path I'm going down is more painful than the actual letting go of it. <laughs> So once I realize, oh my God, it's more painful holding on to all this crap than it would be to actually go through the process of grieving it, yeah. then all of a sudden I, I step out of the way and I let it pass away. And I say that as if I've done it very gracefully. And I can tell you, <laughs> I really haven't. <laughs> I've, I've made a complete balls up of it in the past several times. Um wow. I think that people have real difficulties. I think they get it better yeah. in the end when they finally get there, you know. I think yeah. that it's, you know, because the ego is a manipulative sort of subtle, um, you know, it's a sort of subtle evil sort of influence that's always trying to get in and sort of misdirect you. I think that's all part mm -hmm. of the game. But, you know, I have a picture in my mind where I'm hanging onto this cliff, terrified to let go. And when I look down, there's only two foot to drop, you know what I mean? So there's, there's all that, <laughs> you know. So yeah. and that's, that's what it looked like. I had a friend, you know, God bless him, he's in the world of spirit now, but he used to say it's like pole vaulting over mouse turds, you know, that, that the ego the ego makes such a big deal of stuff when in actual yeah. fact the simplicity of it is just turn left, right? What yes. shall I do? Turn left, yeah. go right. No, no, just turn left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Um, I love that. Um, uh, like something you said earlier, um, which has just like come into, <laughs> it wants to be expressed now. Um, you, you were talking about how, you know, a lot of your family were just like, oh, come on, we just, we just love you. And when you said that, what came into my head, like the voice in my head, how I process things, what I heard and want to share with you is that they would like to say, if only you could see the way we love you, if only you could love you the way we love you. None of that would happen, would it? But is it all part of the setup anyway? I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, you know. And I see that, you know, before we come here, there's almost like a soul, a soul's curriculum office you, where you <laughs> choose you choose what sort of degree you want to do, you know. So, you you know, they sit you down and say, you've done your undergraduate degree, Joe. You didn't do badly there. Now you're on to the master's. Oh, I think, here we go, you know. What do you want to do? I think I'll... Um, I'll do that alcoholic one to go, whoa, it's hard, that one, you know, you know, because when we press this button, you won't remember what you've chosen, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and Joe, you can't change the curriculum, right? Yeah. You know, and, and I, I see it like that as a sort of, um, it's almost like sort of the soul's sort of university, if you like, you know. One thing I'd <laughs> like to get what's coming to me is, you know, one thing I have learned is that the human being goes through various phases to go back to mm. Maslow. So we yeah. start off with instinct. Do you want to, you want to just, um, you know, for the sake of people um, listening, can you just put Maslow in your own words? I mean, I learned it from a training perspective back right. in a previous yeah. career. But it's basically, um, it's a sort of a motivational structure that's a hierarchy, mm -hmm. you know, and you start mm -hmm. off at the low end, if you like, and where your motivations are for survival, yeah. you know. And so everything that you do then is driven unconsciously and through instinct by survival and as you've yeah. got the basic necessities like food and warmth and shelter and stuff like that you move on to the next one which is about relationship then so then mm -hmm. you sort of you come out of your own individual consciousness where you're the true narcissist and all you care about is your own survival when you actually get through that phase to some degree you move up then to relationships then so rather than just being me 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 there's hang on there's something else other than me outside of that then so mm -hmm. then depending on how much energy you've got left right you can then develop uh, relationships then but 
if you're still in survival mode it's hard to you see and fear does that fear keeps you on that lowest rung of the ladder you know there's loads of stuff here you know but uh, the less fear the more that you can develop deeper relationships you know so so that's why at the moment with global situation there's so much fear that relationships are suffering considerably you know but anyway that's that's another story so oh a whole uh, other story isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely so then we move through so the first one's security the next one, sex, it's associated also with an instinct, but it's also associated with hormones as well. So the first level of hormones is adrenaline. The second ones are the sex hormones. Then we move through the next one into society then. And then we come into oxytocin, but also the relationship in bigger groups then. So we can become part of the herd now. Most people don't get past the third stage or 3D because the herd keeps saying to them, that's why, why don't you need to put a lid on a bucket of crabs? Because, because they, don't, they, they don't climb out over each other. Well, that's it. Yeah. And when one tries to climb out, all the others pull you back down again, you see. Oh, and my that's, goodness. That's, you know, so that's, yeah. That's, what, so, that's what humans do, isn't it? Oh, well, my that's goodness. Exactly. And, and they say things like, if you don't do what the groups mm. do it, then we're mm -hmm. going to put you in Coventry. I don't know why Coventry got that name, you know. Should have been no, put in Birmingham or Liverpool <laughs> or something like that. But if you don't do what the group's saying, you're no longer part of the group. Now, it takes considerable courage to dig into your heart to say, well, I don't care about your group anymore because yeah. I've got this influence that's driving me to actually do who I am, to mm. be who I am, and to actually... If, if you want to use words that we use in these communities is to actually follow this deep in, uh, intuition in me, right. And, and perform my soul's purpose. So that's when we become individual, we come out of the collective, which is basically automaton, right. And societally conditioned. And we become then an individual. It's like happy feet. I don't know whether you've seen happy feet. Yeah. yeah, yeah I love it. Yeah, and he gets kicked out to explore the world and he goes back and they sort of see him as a wise experience. And I think that every single human being on the planet is being given an opportunity now to stand on their own two feet and say, mm -hmm. ooh, hang on a second, something mm -hmm. in me doesn't agree what you're trying to force on me here. So I've yes. decided now, I've got to say sovereignty, I'm going to, well, I've, de I've decided now in my own sovereignty because mm -hmm. I feel strong about this, Thank you for your offer, but my answer is no. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's get off that quick. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Do you know what? I loved I loved your crab, um, your crab analogy. I'm gonna definitely use it myself. Because as you were saying that, I was thinking, well, that's what was going on with your mum. Yeah. And 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 your programming at birth, you know, you were being told to stay in the crab pot <laughs> with all the others. Yeah, Don't get yeah. too big. Yeah, well, and it's, it's, not, it's not just that, it was the crab pot, the Catholic pot, the Celtic yes, pot. Yes, yes, it was yes. all those years the and Elon years pot. and years and eons, eons yes. of, yes. of control. Mm. Because when you, were talk, when you were talking about, um, I can't remember what it was now because this, this conversation is so rich, but when you were talking about... Um, um <laughs> so some form of expectation being put oh like your life like what is it that you're doing right now in your life i was thinking we've also got the the oh that's right when you were talking that you chose your life as an alcoholic or you know or you know to have the alcohol degree or the phd in you know you came down to date take that program also we've all come down to take the societal program as well so you're not just doing that degree you're doing one with all of us um, and some of us know we're consciously doing it and some of us most of us don't actually you know we're all doing it together but we're all going through something together right now for sure from my perspective um it's immense <laughs> in fact I, it's so funny i'm gonna i i wrote a few notes just of <laughs> things i wanted to ask you but it's it's just automatically coming out um and you've mentioned like community um 
And um, I notice that you're a community builder. You know, I've, I've had a look around. I, I must say, anyone that's trying to look for you is going to come across a load of famous Joe Delaney's. It's obviously a name with a lot of stature. There's someone who's got great physique, someone with great mental health, some American footballer, authors. Your name carries it all. It really does. But I noticed that you're a community builder. What's the role of community in us getting through this? Is this something we can do together? Or yeah, do we have to all do it on our own or a bit of yeah, both? Yeah, yeah. It's collect I, I think that the way forward is called collective individuality, you know, because we have uh, an individual resonance of souls that's yeah. actually connected to individual uh, skills and attributes, you know. And I think mm -hmm. that mine will be slightly different from yours. But, you know, we need to be. See, there's nobody who's special, but we're all unique. And I believe that wholeheartedly, yeah. you know, yeah. that my resonance, when it's decontaminated, if you like, when mm. it's clean, that that particular resonance represents a key that fits yeah. in that part of the lock, you know. And I think mm. that it's so important. And the root word, I think, of commu uh, communicate, um, communicare and communion is it, it means to share. And it's to share information. And I think that the information will be shared in a resonant sort of way. Where we're having this conversation now, and it's just flowing, isn't it? Because we've not really planned it. It's flowing oh, and yeah. it's adding something in some way. Mm -hmm. God knows what, but you know, it will it will improve the sort of vibrations and things like that. So to get back to, yes, we do need to work together, but it's not in the way, it's moment to moment. You yeah. know, and, and I don't think that we need to be geographically next to one another and physically yeah. in the same space because mm, I think well, right now you're coming from Liverpool and I'm in Portugal, yeah. and yet we're connecting through this amazing internet thing we do. Yeah, yeah, and I think the, the the internet is fantastic, and it's like everything else is. It's the tools, isn't it? It's the mm. intention behind the use of the tools that will determine mm. the sort of. Uh, healthy or unhealthy sort of aspects so all this stuff about electromagnetic radiation and directed energies and all that sort of stuff they can be counted and used in a healthy way I mean, it's it's like aikido aikido is the art of fighting without fighting and it's when you take yes. if you like the enemy's energy and you just sidestep it slightly turn mm. around and use it in a positive way you know, and they've got no idea what's happening to them, you know. Yeah. So, and I think that's the way to go. It's not to directly mm -hmm. fight against them and cause all that conflict. It's actually mm -hmm. to just, you know where I'm going with this. It's to use the energy that's been coming at us and to yeah. find ways internally to transform that and use it mm -hmm. for positive good, you know. I, I, uh, I, I love that. In before, yeah. Can cool. I just put in? Yeah. So just to go back to Maslow. When you mm. then get into your individual state, then what what actually happens is then is you see clearly, right, where you're going then from one moment mm. to the next. And that's what self-actualization is. It's not being perfect. It's actually just to be comfortable in your own skin, to be full and to allow, if you like, the vitality of your soul to guide you on the on the rest of your life on this planet. You know, so so that's what I see. It's a hierarchy, meaning that you don't get to the next stage until you've understood and let go of the chains that actually hold you down in these various stages beforehand. Boom. That, that, that was a great thing to add on. <laughs> now, um, one thing that hasn't really come up, uh, come out in our chat so far, um, you are obviously a very clever chap as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying you haven't come across as clever, but you've not really mentioned the rationality or the study or, or, um, you're not really appealed to the kind of um, the the world that many people inhabit, which is the one of status and um, study and stuff like that. But you're obviously you're also a doctor in terms of you've trained in mindfulness. You understand cardiac coherence. You're a coach. You understand about resiliency and also talk about heart rate variability. I've actually spoken to a couple of different people on my interviews about that, the vagus nerve, biofeedback and stuff like that. So what can you add in? Because you were talking about how we can um, use the force coming towards us and turn it around, transmute it. It's, it's very similar in as much as um, what we're feeling is also mirrored in our physical body. So things can be looked at scientifically and also intuitively. 
Yeah, yeah my, my PhD, I'm not a doctor of medicine, I'm a doctor in medicine. And yeah. what that means is that I don't prescribe medications, you know, <laughs> and my PhD, it took me seven years of analyzing ECGs or EKGs <laughs> in the States. Um, um, in, in, in patients in various um, mind um, states, you know, so yeah. anxiety, stress, uh, depression, um, all sorts of relaxation and stuff. So what I was really is, is how what goes on between our ears impacts mm. upon the rest of our body. But yeah. primarily my research is focused on the way that the heart works. Okay. Wow. So for example, if somebody's stressed and their head's battered, this, I'm going to use sort of both technical and non-technical terms. If their, heads, if their head's battered, then they'll be uh, instinctively in a state of what's called fight and flight. And most mm. people have heard of that now. And in fight and flight, the body needs to prepare itself just in case. So what actually yeah. happens is the heart starts to beat faster. Okay. The breathing increases and all these things happen just in case we need to defend ourselves. So mm. if the ego is threatened, automatically the body will start to defend itself OK, so I was able then to look at the 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 way that the heart beats is most people think that the heart beats very, very regularly and very monotonously from one beat to the next. So bump, 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 bump. There hardly seems to be any difference, but that couldn't be further from the truth. In various states of mind, the heart actually beats bump, 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 bump. Bump. So there's a variability mm -hmm. from one beat to the next. Now, the magic of heart rate variability analysis is you can almost gauge by doing an analysis of that beat to beat variation of what's going on in the brain itself. OK, mm -hmm. so that's what I did, really. I looked at various patterns of where the heart was beating and almost translated them back to what the brain was doing. And what I found out is that through intervening in the way that we breathe, this is really, really important. This this is the neuro, the art and science of really uh, mind body medicine. And this is, I believe this wholeheartedly that we can change the way that we breathe to change the way that the heart works, to change the signal that the heart sends back to the brain in order to create space to make healthier choices. So we change the way the heart works to change the way the head works to get a better life. And that to yeah. me is the neuroscience of mindfulness and actually mindfulness. It's no mindfulness. Because yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always marveling over people yeah. talking about mindful because it's about like having a free mind, isn't it? It, it is. It's, and the space means that there's mm. more, there's more space if you like for the intuition then yeah. to actually feed you with what needs to be done next. But if you don't believe that there's such a thing as intuition and inspiration, then you have to go back out there, work on your own intellect until it all falls apart, right? <laughs> until you get to that crucifixion stage. See, yeah. my job is sort of help people to get quicker to their crucifixion, really. Yeah. And I think that's what truth does. And you know that, Louisa. Truth, <laughs> right. True truth is about saying, say what you mean, mean what you say. And then if someone goes, mm -hmm. Oh, you've offended me, then mm -hmm. in a way, in a way, once they start to understand the principles of no, I didn't offend you. What mm -hmm. I said has caused an emotional reaction in you because your mm -hmm. ego is threatened. And because yeah. ego is the problem, right? I've just done you a favor. <laughs> it's funny you say that because um i i um observed somebody on facebook today so um a very well-meaning person posted something about um death and passing away and then and and it was really beautifully put you know from my perspective i i didn't find myself triggered by it at all um and somebody who's just lost somebody um you know uh, i think father um went into the timeline and said stop it you're not, you're not, uh, you don't have the authority to talk about death. Um, there are thousands of people grieving right now. Just stop it. And, and I went back onto her timeline on another piece again to give her a, a piece of her mind. And um, I was triggered by that. I felt myself get triggered and I, I threw, I put myself into the fray. I didn't yesterday when I first spotted it because I thought, hmm, 
but I did send a message to the person that got a telling off. And then today, you know, when she got a telling off again, I just, I, I felt like I wanted to stand up for her, even though, you know, everyone was contracting in that experience. You know, the person was sharing from her heart. Someone was saying, I don't like it when you share from your heart. And there was me feeling really torn. You know, do I say something or not? Um, in and, and I think it's it's a case of do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? Yeah. I could have, this was my choice that I had this morning was, do I want to be right or happy? And in that moment, I thought, I want to be right. I want to let this person know that she's, and, and, I, and I tried to do it in in a really kind way. Um, but I realized that as I was going backwards and forwards as to what do I say to somebody who's grieving? Do I say something? Don't I say something? But effectively, what I wanted to say is you're making your grief more important than somebody sharing their, their spiritual expression. And I wanted to say, you know, do you see that you're, you're, you're creating more um, grief for yourself by going into it more and more and more? Um, and, and I edited it all um, and, and just said a little bit. And then afterwards thought, oh, why did you do that? Why did you get involved? Um, and so that's the work for me. And, and that's what's happening across the place at the moment. You know, people are feeling offended and triggered and pulled into things. So um, what's, what's your, how, how do we recognize when we're doing that? And, and what can we do differently, do you think, Joe? What I've learned is that um, if I'm feeling disturbed, it's not the divine part of me because the divine part of me oh. just flows with love. You know, so if it's a disturbance, and I don't mean now, if if grief, grief is the divine part of us, right? That's flowing. Yeah. It's a flowing. There's no obstruction. And you mentioned the word contraction. If there's an egocentric contraction, it's an egocentric contraction. And therefore, it's something that needs to be let go of. Because at mm -hmm. some level, whether consciously or unconsciously, we've taken the bait. So yeah. when I feel disturbed now, I have a thing that goes in me. Ooh, just got me there. Take a step back. <laughs> Shut your mouth, Joe. Don't say anything at all, Joe. Shut your <laughs> mouth. Right. Now, sit with it. Do I need to say something? Mm. Do I need not to say something? Or do I need to let it go? They're the three yeah. choices. And mm. if I let it go and it comes back, then that was the wrong choice. Oh, that's clever. Okay. Mm. If I say something and feel bad about it, that was probably the wrong choice. Right. <laughs> You see what I mean? So if, yes. if I'm not able to go forward, come back or sit in neutral, then I'm stuck, you see. So now if I say something and it was the wrong choice, then I can go back and say to the person, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. You know, yeah. I, I'm, I was trying to feel my way through this and I don't know. Mm -hmm. If I'm upset, I do apologize. And then mm -hmm. you've cleaned your side of the street then. Yeah. If they want to carry it on, that's nothing to do with you then. But if mm -hmm. you choose to get back there's an expression that says if you don't want to fight don't get into the boxing ring yeah 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 okay but sometimes sometimes you need to you know and, yeah. I, and I don't know the answer to specifics but the principles mm. are that I don't know what to do I'll stick it in my heart my heart mm. will say go back and apologize to that people uh, that person yeah. My head will say, do I have to? You know, like a little child. <laughs> do I have to? My heart will say, you know you do. Go and yeah, say sorry. It. Right. And as yeah. soon as your ego goes, oh, all right, then, you start to mm -hmm. get a feeling of, yeah, I'll go and do that anyway. So then you take the mm -hmm. action. And I think that that's how we're supposed to navigate through life. We don't know mm -hmm. the answer immediately. We've almost yeah. got to feel our way through that whole process. But that's just the way I see it and feel it. I love that. Yeah. Yes. Because um, we always do have the choice of um, each moment, each moment and each breath. We have a choice <laughs> to um, go back to apologize. Yeah, I love that. That's amazing. Um, I feel like I've had so much of your time and energy and, and I've really enjoyed it. Before before we wrap this up, I just want to find out what you're working on at the moment, because presumably somebody who is led by the heart on a moment by moment basis, you've got some kind of, I don't want to say master plan, but I'm sure spirit or the universe is talking through you at the moment. What's what's coming up for you? Well, there's a couple of things. I'm I'm semi-retired now, so I still have a profession to sort of um, 
an associateship with a medical school at a local university. So I'm, I'm supervised lots of dissertations and stuff like that. So that's keeping me going money wise, but mm -hmm. I need to do something else now to start trying to make some other money, you know? So I'm going to start doing workshops physically yeah. and online as well. I mean, all the stuff's there. I just need the time to put it all together. So that will yeah. be something that will be coming out. I'm also, and I keep getting this push. Uh, I'm, I'm writing a book right it's only in its uh, developmental stages you know early stages but it's going to be called um the f off approach to health and happiness you know because they, genius they call me <laughs> and let me explain why it's called the f off approach they call me dr f in joe you know because sometimes when they're expressing myself i can't help myself you know and i don't mean to offend anybody but if they get offended it's only their ego that's offended yeah. <laughs> so the F off, but it doesn't stand for what you think it does. It's a little trick. And it was given to me clearly by my intuition, this. Mm -hmm. It stands for focus on feelings first. And that's what I've learned yes. to do is I help people to reconnect with their bodies and their feelings and to sit with their feelings and to sit with and allow the experience and the lesson of the feeling to come through so that the, we can go forward then so that's the it's called um there's no f in stress <laughs> if you focus on feelings first and it will basically be about simple practical solutions to disconnect from the emotional engagement of that ego attachment so mm -hmm. that you can clear some space to see a bigger picture so you get a better menu of options with which to choose to go forward with and if you make a mistake, you can say, sorry, I've made a mistake. Sorry mm -hmm. seems to be the hardest word. It's not for me anymore. I don't I don't say sorry everywhere I'm going. But I say, is there a need for me to make an apology here? Yes, there is, Joe. Go and make an apology, you know. So that's what I'm working on. Workshops. Um, that's what I'm up to, really. So um, how can people contact you if they, if they want to reach out to you? Well, I'm developing a new... Um, a new youtube channel so i'll be putting that it's called um getting real with dr joe it's called oh so that's I'll, lovely yeah so I'll, I'll be, I'll be, for it. and there's another famous dr joe dr joe Dispenza. i would say yeah. if, you, if you get on his site stay there because he's got a load of good stuff you know he's really he's brilliant but um so getting real with dr joe yeah getting real and i'm gonna start uh, working on that one so that will be one way the other way is I'm on Facebook, but I'm, I'm up to the limits on friends. Um, so you can click follow, I think. I think that that's mm -hmm. how that works. And um, I'm also on Instagram. You know, all this other stuff, LinkedIn and Instagram, and I'm sort of getting around to finding a way to just put one mm -hmm. thing up that goes to all them. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okie dokes. Well, I'll put, I'll put links in at the bottom of the show. So Thanks. anyway, um, I just want to thank you. Um, for being so wholeheartedly human, beautiful, divine, and all of that <laughs> it is amazing. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. I've, lo I've loved every minute. It went quickly, didn't it? That's always a good sign. It really did, yeah. Wowzers. I love that, and I hope you did too. I'm feeling very calm and also quite giggly <laughs> at the same time. Um, I've put in the links um, to uh, co connect with Dr. Joe should you feel this sort of inrush of emotion to do that. Um if you've enjoyed this, please do um, think about subscribing if you haven't already and also click on the notification bell so that the next time I interview someone just like Dr. Joe or even when he comes back for another chat um, that you get a notification of it. Anyway, thanks once again for your beautiful presence. Hope to connect again with you real soon. Bye for now. Hey.